to the first Trius reading of the year, starring this year's writer in residence, Cosmogony. Uh, before we dive into it, I would like to acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of the Onondaga, or the people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as the Seneca people, the keeper of the Western Door, one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, often described as the oldest participatory democracy on Earth. A couple of quick announcements. We have two more really, really exciting Trius readings this semester curated by our writer in residence. On Thursday, October 24th, here at 7 p.m., poet Glaz Falconer will read. And on Thursday, November 7th, Rajiv Mohabir will read also, um, also here. Uh, and the English and Creative Writing Department will host in the Blackwell Room of Demarest our scary fall rapid fire reading featuring both students and faculty on October 30th. That is the night before All Hallows Eve. Sign up to read for Side Living or Side Dead slash Undead. You can read your own work or the work of someone else, including famous living people, famous dead people, and famous undead people, I guess. Uh, email me, Catherine Coles, for more information. You can find my email address on the English Department webpage under faculty. The rapid fire is always a ruckus fun night. Um, I must thank the rest of the Trees Committee, which includes Melanie Conway Goldman, Jeffrey Babbitt, and Ben Risto for their help and support. Uh, thanks to Tina Smaldone, who made sure everything was set up beautifully. And shout out to the Trius Workshop, a group of 12 students lucky enough to be taking a class with our wonderful writer in residence. And finally, I must thank Peter Trius himself, our patron saint of creative writing, who graduated from HWS, went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, wrote a beautiful book of poems, and then became a real estate mogul in Malibu, which you'll be shocked to learn is not always the career trajectory of poets. <laughs> Peter Trius then generously, generously endowed the residency in the reading series and has thereby enriched the lives of so many students, faculty, and community members at this point that we lost count. Thank you, Peter. Wherever you are, we love you. Thanks also to Ed Rothfarb, Peter's partner, whom I got to meet recently and who is simply wonderful. This year's Trius Writer in Residence, Kazim Ali, was born in the UK and has lived in the United States, Canada, India, France, and the Middle East. He's written and translated something like 26 books, right around there. Uh, he's edited a number of anthologies and critical editions. He's been awarded a bunch of awards. Uh, he's got a new book coming out later this month uh, on the, the poetry and poetics of Lucille Clinton and I've been pestering him about when my pre-order is going to arrive so that I can read it. Uh, Say it again. I did see it. I, that's what made me want to, that's what made me want to get a copy of it. And he's currently a professor of literature at the University of California, San Diego. So when we make a poster for a Trius reading, we generally list the genre in which a visiting writer tends to write. This is normally a fairly straightforward proposition. We put something like novelist or poet, maybe essayist, but we had a really hard time when making the poster for tonight's reading, listing Cosimo's writing genre. You see, we ran out of room. Poet, essayist, novelist, hybrid memoirist, cross-genre writer, translator from multiple languages, founding editor of the wonderful Night Boat books, editor of several anthologies and books of criticism, critical writer, even gender-inclusive choose-your-own-adventure story writer. Uh, as the font for writing genre under Ollie's name got smaller and smaller on the poster to accommodate all these titles, eventually we realized we'd have to narrow it down. There is no holding, anyway, what Ollie does in a little handful of words. It is perhaps then not surprising that I never know what to expect when I open a book by Cosimoli, because each turns out to be completely different from the last in its completely own genre, written in a different form, using language in a different light, just completely new. 
Each book is shaped exactly to the experiences, to the shifts, to the people, to the circumstances around it, and perhaps most importantly, each book opens itself up to unanticipated revelation. Each book is made in the process of discovering what kind of book it is. So, in Indian Winter, all these newest novels, for instance, the fictionalized narrator starts out writing a book called Michael, a novel. But he soon crosses that subtitle out and replaces it with Michael and Erasure, the book documenting its own changed making. At one point, the narrator is in an art museum looking at paintings, and he imagines ways each painting might be, quote, transformed structurally into forms of fiction. In the end, this is what the book is about as much as anything, finding a way to translate things into the things in the world into words on the page. The thing the book's title, original title page told itself it was about is entirely other than how it turned out because Ali knows how to follow when a text turns itself around. In Northern Light, Ali sets out to visit the town where he learned to speak and write and where his father worked on a dam but ends up. But the book ends up thinking as much about an adjacent Pamichikamak indigenous community whose unceded land the dam was built upon. Quote, places do not belong to us. We belong to them. The form of the book, again, goes hand in hand with the content. The same is true with his poems. Sometimes all these poems are propelled forward on a tumble of their own sound, as with Prayer for Chasm, which sounds a whole lot like Prayer for Chasm, and is full of homonyms, of twinning words, uh, this poem is the first in Sukun, Always New and Selected, which is for sale in the back, but originally appeared in the book Ternary. Listen to how the sounds redouble and slip, how lines, line breaks contain sudden hinges into new meaning. And I'll try to read the line breaks here. Always this dealer of done deals of what's done after done plain, grass wanting then to lie at the beach, sun and sky, and salt, let it all have you, have it at you. In the voice of Sheila Chandra, also for sale in the back, another brilliant and utterly itself recent poetry collection, Ali adopts a sort of punctuationless semi-run-on sentence in lieu of the usual poetic line in some places. Each sentence is a stanza running at the speed of thought, pushing itself to the edges of what it can do before moving on to the next sentence. And here's a smattering of excerpts from a piece that resists excerpting. Imran Qureshi does not paint on canvases, but paints little blossoms on the ground, on the wall, in corners of the room. They bloom like water or blood or light. And at the beginning of the universe, Amjit Sabri sings away for all he's worth, his voice unspooling soi savage, like a bolt of raw silk, like an untamed spirit. And he hopes to find God, echo, locate him deep in the harmonic overtone, perhaps at precisely the place his voice breaks. And are we pieces made up of pieces made up of pieces? And can we sing over the noise or paint down on the stone once marked by flesh and death? Can we move forward without breaking? And what if God is improvising like Coltrane? There are as many genres of Cosm Ali books as there are Cosm Ali books, and I love them all, each of which feels like its own person. I love watching the thinking happen in real time in these books, love thinking alongside them, discovering the particular humanity of each. I love the way the books love their different things and the world. I love their intelligence and vision and connection and grace. How very lucky we are to have their author, for lack of a complex enough genre designation, here on campus for the semester. Please join me in welcoming Kazumali. Thank you so much for that beautiful, um, beautiful introduction. Um, sometimes when one hears oneself introduced with kind of like the standard um, bullet point breakdown of one's own life, it's like, 
you feel like you're dead <laughs> and you're listening <laughs> to someone talk about you at your funeral. But that was like being alive <laughs> or coming back to life, which is really special. You said author at the end, which I don't like that word either because it's author is someone who has authority. And I think I don't, or we don't often over the things that we write, know, um, know them. We don't know them. This is prayer for chasm. What you ask for, hold me, hold. New moon wants you unseen, unctuous, willing to go to any length to rise. You lie on your back in the cold spring, lost or tossed. How they are the same, both questions to a world unanswerable. You were never known, none can spell your name. So impossible you unpronounce, never in knowable days. Able to be in a place, be a person who speaks, who thinks, who does the laundry. Always instead this dealer of done deals, of what's done after done plain grass, wanting then to lie at the beach, sun and sky and salt. Let it all have you, have at you, jailed at the shore, sure that the near star will unravel solar threads to spin in gold squares, a new narrative of normal, the one where you stop answering, the one where you stop asking how deep this hole, this chasm between who you were, are, thought you would be, you do not cross are not afraid. The chasm is a thought. Who is thinking, I will live? So it might be easier uh, in a fashion to look at the poems on the page while I read them because of what Catherine said of the homonyms, the homonyms, I am a homo myself, so <laughs> one, one would imagine, uh, who, he, him pronouns though, don't get it twisted. It's okay, I mean you can, yeah, any pronouns are fine really, but um, uh, this is a poem called Golden Boy, and it also leans into um, words that sound like other words, and I guess you can tell that I take a lot of punctuation out and let the borders between the words kind of leak into each other. Um, that might be political too, so you might not always have a, a ground to stand on. But why, why shouldn't we swim in language? This poem is called Golden Boy. Almost afraid I am in the annals of history to speak, and by speaking be seen by man or God. Such then debt in life be paid. Atop the Manitoban Parliament building in Winnipeg, what beacon to dollars food or God does shine? I hallow starvation. This nation, a notion beneath the body, hollowing its stomach to emptiness, and in breath, the river empties. Whoso spoke, the craft born along, long echo and echelon, grains of light and space, we with one and other wait. The soul, not the spirit, breathe through, spirited, went or went, why true, we've woe, we've woven a dozen attempts, these tents pitched on the depth be made by pen, by pen, may perch atop the temple pool, proven now, proven these riches of wheat and cherries and prunes, what washes over woven ocean frayed, I am most, sir, desired. Sired in wind, seared and warned, once in wild umiak sworn. 
We parley to mend, be conned, be bent. Come now, call to document your meant intent, your indented mind. Hall, O oh star, your weight in eons. There in the prayer, money, morrow, more, you owe and over time. God spends the spent river, melt into summer. Sound out the window, sound out the spender. Where does the river road end? In what language can prayer or commerce be offered? Ender of senses, pensive atop, plural spires, be spoken or mended, broken and meant for splendor, my mentor. That's my Ars Poetica, I suppose you could say. I became very interested in um, the mythological figure of Icarus. Um, Icarus is the son of Daedalus, the builder of the labyrinth. Um, his father tried to escape the labyrinth, and so he built wings and he told his son, you know, fly for the horizon, don't fly too high to the sun because the wax will melt. Don't fly too low to the surface of the water or you'll get captivated by the fish moving below the surface and you'll fall in. And so of course the boy didn't listen and his wax melted and then he fell into the sea and he drowned. That's how the story goes. If you watch Chaos, does anyone watch Chaos? Am I the only person in the room who watches Chaos? Go home and watch Chaos. <laughs> There's a character in there who's uh, based on me. No, not really. <laughs> uh, the kid, my, my partner called me up and he said, you gotta watch this show. There's a guy in it based on you. And it's the god Dionysus. He's played by an Indian actor. He looks a little like me, not much like me, but a little enough like me. And he's got my style too, so my partner wanted me to to get a load of him on the small screen. Uh, so I watch it. Anyways, um, it, 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 it's updated Greek mythology. It takes place in the present moment, and the gods are real. So that, that's the premise of that show. And what's interesting about it, why I'm telling you about it, is that um, in the show, there's a character based on Daedalus, and Icarus the son is dead, as he is in the myths. But uh, I wrote this, this story, these poems about Icarus. So I'm going to read them to you because I thought, oh my god, I wish that it was before so I could see Icarus on the screen, because that's the character I identify with the most, really, being, you know, the son who is just too fabulous for his father's strict rules and laws about how he's supposed to behave. It's basically the story of my life. So, <clears throat> I should have got some flowers on the It's okay. This poem is called The Escape. I went to the spinning class at the gym just like an hour ago, and the, the woman who was there kept saying to me, do you need water, do you need water? And I was like, no, I don't need it, I don't need it. And there was just this like pouring down. She kept looking over and saying, are you sure, are you sure? Um, I will be like Icarus diving into the ocean. The Escape. Father, whose purpose swims while the universe mends itself. Wind was water, porpoise was prophet. Father, my swim, the sutured eventual blue splinters. Seed planter, hedonist, heathen when the unwise son fell to pieces, purposeless when the father flew for cover. The cloven will cleave. The water finishes itself, finishes me. Stream unreeling, you are the end of the world, an endless horizon, and it's a sham, this charnel choice between heaven and home, because finally I am free of the labyrinth, and overhead I see nothing but sky. Alas, poor Icarus, the sun was overhead, the wax did melt, and he plunged into the sea. C. 
sinking. You became real to me, Father, when I saw you fly over me from beneath the waves, a bone-white door against the cloud-white ceiling, looking for me, flapping and furious. I watched you in the dark as you slept, knowing the edge of you only by deeper darkness. Below you now in the blue-black, I am a star winking out, thinking I may wake up warm and safe in the labyrinth. And not ever do this, not seek for the sun, Oh, Father, my storm-dark coast, nothing fills. I could not allow him to drown, so I thought, let me give him a chance. He would swim for the surface, wouldn't he? And here is his prayer. Denuded and abandoned, I recite, but what do I want? To rise again from the ocean, or be buried alive in the surge and sleep? To be a fearsome range in a single body, or to wind my unity down into death? Missing in action, ghost-like, bobbing in the distance, singing songs to terrify myself into deciding. So long, liberation. My time in the world was only a gesture. My body, a lonely stranger. An ache I never knew. And then I had to leave him. I had to give him a shot, so I left him in the middle of the book, in the dead center of that book. I left him floating in the middle of the water. This poem is called Adrift. Granted, things don't look good for the lad, but at least he has a fighting chance. Adrift. Oh, the diminishing racket of voices calling my name, eclipsed by the new moon and indiscernible dark. I have somehow become the center of the universe. I wept for a year on the open water, strangling myself with banishment, sensation vanishing in the depths. The rain, a faded photo from 15 years ago. I am a forgotten bit of metropolitan trash tied to his moment of redrawing the border between twilight and daybreak, forever at the edge of something that could save me and the disastrous fear of what it would take to save me. My life in its entirety was only imaginary, or perhaps the rapturous notion that I cannot be saved. So uh, I'd like to read you a poem that I wrote in um, 2008. I was in the south of Spain. I was in a city called Cordoba. Cordoba is one of the old uh, well, as every old city in the south of Spain is, it's an Arab city uh, it, from Arab Spain. It was founded in, I don't know, 800 or 900 AD. Um, and at that time, the, most, of, most of the peninsula of Spain was Arab. But um, when I was in Cordoba, uh, I learned of the death of the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. And Darwish himself, had written a poem about the Greek poet Ioannis Rizos, a great 20th century poet. Rizos and Darwish were both politically uh, radical. Uh, they were both communists, as it happened, and they both spent much time of their life in detention. So they had a lot in common. And 
1982, when the Palestinian leadership fled Beirut on August 6th during the bombing of Beirut, they fled by boat because the airstrips were destroyed. Um, they, they went to Athens as the first port of call. They ended up in Tunisia, as it happens, um, in exile, but the first port of call was Athens. And when Yanis Ritos learned that Darvish was going to be on the boat coming in, he went down to the harbor to meet the boat. So this poem is called Yanis Ritos, and it starts with Ritos, and, it, and it, it is about Ritos at the beginning, but then the poem, like the Palestinian people who lived their life in diaspora, the poem itself wanders across the world and through time, um, and includes me in Cordoba, actually, and then it actually ends somewhere totally different. So, uh, I'll read this poem to you. The epigraph of the poem is a quote from Mahmoud Darwish's poem about Yanis Rizos. Athens was welcoming to those who had come from the sea. Yanis, you held him in the glare of the diamonded sea, unteaching him his practical mantra of liberation, maybe seeing in him a son to take care of you in your loneliness. Loneliness varnished by your detention in the house made of flower stems that thrust through the rocks in the prison yard, its roof made of unscannable lines of rain. You revealed to him the sound of the rusty hinged door, how it would swing sadly open and reveal no homeland beyond at all. He came from the sea, dragging his anklets of keys. Did you teach to him then how all the old locks and houses of his hometown were already broken? Yanis. In the end, he rinsed the last of the coast roads dust from his body after a lifetime of pressing his language into lines of poetry and prayer and prestigitation tired of praising mosques in which he could not pray. The same morning, I was forbidden by the guard to pray at the mosque of Cordoba. He woke up in Houston, Texas, and went to a mall food court to meet for the first and last time his translator. The words they spoke to one another were the same as those I saw in stone fragments on the floor of the archaeological dig at Medina da Zahra, the ruined capital of the West, looking east toward the cities left behind. That city had remained buried in a field outside Cordoba for a thousand years. The palace and throne room had been torn apart, the rubble of the mosaics now being painstakingly reassembled, piece by piece, unlike the villages of Palestine, disassembled down to stone. Giannis, what did you say to him that blue afternoon when the steel canoe landed and he arrived in another place that would be home and not home? In Cordoba, meanwhile, the story of his death flashed across the morning news, scrolling along the bottom of the screen from clay to nothing. But let's let the sea have the last word. The sea he crossed to come to you, or the one that sparkled off the coast of Chile when he in Neruda's house remembered you. Or the sea that rained that lightly down as the poet and his translator huddled together over cheap food court coffee to converse in a shopping mall in Texas, though it could have been Athens or Palestine or Neruda's house, at least as good as any mosque in the world, so long as there was coffee and poetry and the sound of rain. Rain in the shape of the river, rain in the shape of a broken lock, rain in the shape of long since written verses, while the translator of lost homelands 
makes from the sound of butterfly wings rain in the shape of the dark furnace of days. I feel like I should read to you a little new thing, a thing or two that is new. I'm going to continue on my Icarus tip, and this is, I don't know if it's a poem, uh, a prose poem, or a little essay, or a, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think it's probably, it's not important. Uh, it probably isn't, right? So anyways, it's called The Flight of the Icarus. The Flight of the Icarus. Uh, and it is written in prose, just like that. For our final project in high school physics class, we had to use only toothpicks and glue to build a structure around an egg that would protect it from being broken after being dropped from a second floor balcony onto the thinly carpeted floor of the auditorium. The same auditorium in which the drama club would later practice our production of Our Town, in which I had been cast as Cy Crowell, not a very important role, only six lines in the second act, a single scene, but enough to keep away from home for another two hours at the end of the school day. The director decided to use all of the cast members with only a few lines as extras in the wedding scene, and we were supposed to enter, find another cast member, make brief improvised small talk over the music that would be playing as we took our seats in the pantomimed church. My friend Beth, who was also my girlfriend back when I imagined I wanted girlfriends, and I decided that our exchange would consist of me greeting her with a big cheerful smile, saying, fuck you, Erna. <laughs> to which she would reply with equal pleasure, fuck you, Cy. Small stage time aside, Cy Crowell is actually considered by critics to be a somewhat important character in the play. He is meant to symbolize the passing of time and a foreshadow to the death of Emily in the third act, spoiler alert, his older brother Joe having had the paper route in act one and having been killed by act two in the Great War. If there was any character in our town I actually did identify with, it was Simon Stimson, the drunk choir director who cannot abide the pettiness and limitations of small town. By Act 3, he too is dead by his own hand. Brian, the kid who played Simon with a little too much realistic flair, was the most beautiful and melancholy boy in the whole school. He spent most of his time handing, hanging around the art wing, and in all the years that have followed, I never heard about him again, though I dream he escaped the suburbs and climbed a mountain lives among the clouds. As one of the ghosts in the cemetery says, if it ain't rain, it's a three-day blow. There was something thrilling, I don't have to tell you, about saying fuck you on a stage in a period play in front of an audience of hundreds of students and teachers, including Vice Principal Sugg, who always vetted every play the drama club wanted to mount to make sure it was appropriate for high school audiences, and in a different way, more secret, more ridiculous, more thrilling, to also say, if it ain't rain, it's a three-day blow. <laughs> there was something. <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was bullied almost every day in high school. Either for being Muslim or for being gay, which I didn't even know myself then. I mean, those high school bullies had really good gaydar. <laughs> I was so good at hiding the fact that I was being bullied that not even my best friends knew, but still, physics and loneliness somehow got me through. Rather than create some kind of logical armature to cup the egg or to successively break its fall in careful stages, I just started flush against the shell, adding a thicket of toothpicks at every angle, building outward in a clustered mess. I called my ship the Icarus, 
and everyone else in class teased me and jeered at how foolish it was and how ugly it looked and how it would never survive the fall little ball of thorns that it was. Mr. Schumacher's face betrayed nothing as he carried the little crown of thorns holding its fragile heart up to the balcony. He held it over the railing like something sacred and looked down at me, a question in his eyes. I didn't even see the moment he let it go. It just seemed to be traveling toward me, the wooden shards built so tightly around it that I wouldn't have guessed there was anything within. The carpet at the bottom had already been covered with a white plastic tarp, now thick with sticky white albumen and slick with yellow streaks of yolk. There was no sound as the vessel landed other than a soft crumpling as some of the tips gave way. Mr. Tozzolino, who was waiting at the bottom, bent over to pick up the mostly still intact structure. Do you see how hardly any of it is broken? He asked the class, holding it out to show them. Because of all the different angles, each toothpick reinforces every other. I couldn't explain to you how I knew what to do. My math was terrible, and I was on track to fail the class, not least of which was because my lab partner, Felipe, a foreign exchange student from Venezuela with slender thighs and a long, sweeping mullet that fell across his lithe neck like feathers, and who used to weigh himself every day after lunch, which he skipped in order to run endless laps around the indoor track, logging his weight in precise numbers in the back of his physics textbook, 76 kilograms, 74.7 kilograms, 72.3 kilograms, 71 kilograms, was at least as stupid as I was and definitely as bad at math. That's a paragraph long sentence. And even though I desperately wanted to be an actor, I'm pretty sure the only reason I was cast as Cy Crowell was because Neele Shaw, a four and a half foot tall, 90 pound freshman who was a five alarm charmer, had been cast as Joe, even though Neele was Jane and we were Muslim, I mean really Muslim, so Muslim we had a giant picture of Khomeini above our fireplace at home where most kids had a family portrait or a sculpture of birds or a vase of flowers. Everyone always lumped me and Neele together. As it was, my head was one of only three in the entire class that didn't break. And Mr. Schumacher, well aware that I knew nothing about centripetal force or centrifugal force, nor velocity, nor matter, or mass, or bodies in motion, or bodies at rest, still determined that my feat of somehow surviving gravity merited at the very least a B plus. So. <laughs> Uh, I am going to end with, and then I think there's going to be two questions after radio toss. Oh, and there's water. <laughs> um, I figured that I would uh, ought to end with, um, well, I'm actually going to end with a poem from this, going to go back to this book and we do one more poem from here. But I thought I would end, um, before I do that, I thought it would be nice to read, um, uh, I have not written any poems in a year and a half. Uh, my mother passed away in May of 2023, so like a year and a half ago. And uh, three weeks after she died, I wrote seven poems in seven days. And then I didn't, I haven't written anything since that time. It was like the middle of June in 2023, so a year and three months. And I came here and I thought, okay, I'm going to be a writer in residence. I'm going to teach people about writing poetry and I am not writing any. And so I was actually on the phone with my partner and I said, uh, I'm not, I don't know if I can, I think I'll just teach, but I'm not gonna be writing, it's gonna be weird. And then that very night I thought, okay, the lake is right over there. It's not very far away from where my house is or from where we are sitting. I mean, it's, it's like right over there. And it's a lot of water. Um, and I, I believe in energetic, I don't know, auras or something. So I thought, let me just tune in. And so I've written a couple of things <clears throat> in, the, in those days. Since then, it was, it's been about 10 days, and I've written probably like 15 poems since then. So I'm just going to read three little drafts to you. Or is it four? Hold on. One, chicken for breakfast. 
is four little poems. They're all really, really short. I'll just say one thing about them. You've listened to me recite to you, so you know like, what my poems are kind of generally like, and I feel like these are total strangers to me, so that's kind of exciting. Stone World. Now I'm laked. Now anger and ache. A man who is not my father arrives to feed me. I have always been fed, even when I didn't know. The lake, the graves which spell out the names of the white dead, dark and alone, this world turns to stone. Okay, this is chicken for breakfast. <laughs> A book led me to the cello suite and listening to the music and watching the cellist play so tentatively, I imagined dance, a body moving slowly in the morning, emerging from death. Chicken for breakfast. How do you survive a day when you have no mother to tell you in the morning, time to change? <clears throat> this poem is called Sandwich. I wanted to go to the cemetery with a sandwich and have a picnic, how people do, instead of just going and saying prayers. But it rained too hard and I had to run for the car. Why do people run for the car? What do we think is going to happen? We are only going to get a little wet. It is not as if we are going to die, except we are all going to die. When I go to the cemetery, I always lose my place, and for a moment, I cannot find her grave. And for that moment, or two, or more, it feels like you are not dead. You are not dead. And then this little, um, poem is called Fasale, which means distances in Urdu, and it's the name of a Pakistani soap opera that my mom used to love watching, and my dad still watches it now, even though he never watched it. I mean, he used to watch it with her, but he hated it, but now he like, still watches it. So this is called Fasale. And it is strange, heavy drops of rain, and bright sun, and then rain again. There is a Pakistani soap opera on TV with all the tropes, a wicked mother-in-law, a table full of sweets. I was very late to realize that the happy ending was fiction's cruelest invention. All right, and I will close with this little poem. I, did I told you that I left Icarus in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> treading water, um, but as it happens, I did leave him in the middle of that book, treading water, but I could not, I could not leave him there. So this poem is called Confession. I am drifting now, cold and stolen, the sun-bound one giving lie to the myth I fell. Only a story spun to warn back heathen suns who burn too brightly. I saw the feathers flutter down like pages from the old man's book. Dead scared of heights, I am the wrong boy for the job of proving gravity's limit. But wings are small things invented by men who could not but cut the cobalt sky from the sapphire sea, while I want to weave blue and blue together. So when the feathery pages sank damp beneath the waves and the ink streamed clear to nothing, the story goes, I drowned. Dear God, Father of Light, I must excuse myself from the formula. Nothing adds up to me, an equation desperate to be solved. I abandoned both wings and sun for the blue direction, and I swear by the flowers in my mouth, I will find some place on this earth that knows.
loves me. Thank you. Well, I do, but I feel a responsibility as a citizen. I think no matter what position I found myself in, I would feel responsible. I feel that way as a teacher, I feel that way as a writer, and I feel that way um, as an American, um, because um, so much of our own history um, has been tied up in injustice towards others, including enslavement, including land seizure, um, uh, you know, unfair economic systems that self-perpetuate, um, that we end up now with structural racism and classism. It, it's structural means it's not a person deciding to discriminate against you, it's just the way things are set up is discriminating against you. So, you know, someone was saying something about like, you know, there was some scientific study that was put on, someone was posting about it on Facebook, and they were saying like, oh, you know, now can your genes determine like what your career will, will be later in life? And then the person answered underneath that, they said, your zip code can, me meaning something real, which is that, you know, because of, you know, how our economic system works, that level of discrimination is baked into it in a way. So we have this, I feel, I have a sense of responsibility to address these kinds of injustices, it's fair to do it on an individual level, one-on-one, -on -one, and, and you know, treat everyone you meet with kindness and respect, or don't discriminate against a person in daily life, but we also have to act on the structures and create policies that undo some of these, um, uh, you know, situations that exist in our society. And for sure the United States of America, for sure any, uh, all of the governments in the, in the Western Hemisphere are built on it. But so are all the governments in the Eastern Hemisphere, you know, it's just, this is, this is how power um, plays a role in our lives. So if we're not, if we're not acting socially, it means we are okay with the status quo. And the status quo in general is reaping the benefits of other people's labor, you know, in a way, that's, that is also unfair, you know. So, it's just, I guess it's part of how I think. It's not as if, I don't know how it happened for me personally, it's not as if every person in my family is a radical, although sometimes you meet a person who is like that, everyone in their family is, you know, working hard and, and you know, active politically, um, that's not the case for me. Uh, it just, uh, I went to a public university, I went to the University of Albany, SUNY, so uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Western New York. I grew up outside, I grew up outside of Buffalo. 
And when I went to my undergrad, I was there with kids from all over New York State and the country and the world. Um, but they, I guess I, I had a, you know, uh, a subconsciousness raising that happened there. <laughs> so I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, you did. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I have three things. Two of them aren't technically as important as the last one. But one, I love your hair color. Oh, thank you. It's all natural. <laughs> two, are you wearing lipstick or is that your natural lip color? No, girl. It's uh, actually, I'll give you a little hack. It's eye pencil. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> And you just outline and it just sort of creates a shadow and it also doesn't come off when you drink. Oh, it looks really pretty. Um, my last one's the question. Yeah. Um, and it's, what do you feel most... I like different? how you said they're all equally important. <laughs> yes, they are. hundred percent, I agree with you. Clearly. I know this is mostly like a jeans and Birkenstocks campus, or like a shorts and oh. socks and sliders campus. Deeply. <laughs> but like, you should put some effort into it, you know? I completely agree. Now everyone in my class is going to come in with looks next week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been turning out some looks for you guys. I've been going, I've been trying to, I've been having a slow open, you know? I can tell, I can tell. A little more excitement later on. So can't, you can't start with like your best work, you know? You gotta, you gotta okay. get easy. Yeah. So go ahead, what is your question? Okay, so my question is, what do you feel most dictates your tone when you speak your poetry out loud? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I kind of like, what I love about poetry the most is hearing it in performance, and I really love the music, like musical performance and mellifluous performance. Um, I don't happen to love most spoken word because a lot of times people are just hollering at you and I just, I feel like aggrieved, sort of. Um, there's a lot to holler about, but I'd rather be sung to, personally. I mean, Orpheus sang to the dead, the king of the dead, in order to be allowed to walk back up to the earth with his wife following behind him, right? So, um, uh, but I love listening to, to poetry and music and um, I love uh, folk singers who sing, uh, the song lyrics are very much like poems. Uh, so I guess, uh, and I studied meter and rhyme um, when I was writing, so I guess all of that is the most important to me. Okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I do like spoken words, it's just sometimes it gets a little bit intense. Hi. Hi. Uh, what you, what decisions do you have about your vernacular? Like what influences, what words do you, you choose? Oh, that's really interesting. I don't know. I think partially I feel like I, that's, I, I showed you a couple of different sides. I mean, I showed you some poems that have like a more of an elevated diction, and maybe even some archaic kind of words. And I do get excited by bringing the old, like the old, older or ancient into the contemporary to see what happens. And I like moments when different dictions or registers, very formal, or jostling up against the very colloquial. I think it's exciting. We were talking about it in my class when we, when we were workshopping poems, and apologies to the person if I'm gonna quote your poem, it's embarrassing to you. Um, but someone had a phrase in the poem, the carnal ship ship like a sailing ship, and the adjective was carnal. And we had to stop and talk about how exciting I thought that was, because it's an adjective like, uh, ships are normally like trustworthy, they could be grand, they can be, I don't know if you're describing them physically, they could be wooden or long. You know, there are many things that ships are. Carnal is not something we normally think of a ship being, you know? So suddenly when you use a phrase like that, your own head as the hearer or reader of the poem is like, oh, this is kind of weird, what does that mean? And it becomes like, that's what poetry is to me, it's those moments where language does, you know, something really unexpected. Which is why when I read to you those three short little poems that I wrote here last week, I said they were unusual for me because mostly they don't really do that. Like the chicken for breakfast poem is just like, chicken for breakfast, you know? And actually I called it that because it was so silly. Like I chose the title, the poem about the cemetery, the title could have been the cemetery, or the title could have been You Are Not Dead, but instead I called it, or the title could have been Heavy Rain, 
but instead I called it Sandwich, because it was like, it was sort of ridiculous for a poem about someone visiting the cemetery to see the grave of their mother, which is like the most serious thing in the world, and have that poem be bear the title Sandwich. So I guess I like to lean into the, the surprise or the unexpected. She's got one. Oh, there's one over here. Oh, he's got one. Hello. Hi. Um, so I heard that you like dropped Orpheus in there, and of course you have your poems about um, Icarus, and I'm going to the classics here on campus, so of course I picked up on that. But I was just wondering if you have possibly written other poems about different Greek or Roman iconography or other antiquity iconography and how it differs from the poems that you have written for Icarus. Yeah, I do love them in general. I have a poem about Persephone, um, who's a boy in my poem, because he's me, so I just made him into a boy. Uh, Persephone, as a, it's called Persephone as a Boy. Bjork has a song called Venus as a Boy, so I thought, okay, if Bjork can do it, I can do it <laughs> as well. Um, I wrote about Orpheus. I do have a poem about Orpheus in my new um, book of poetry that is not coming out. Um, I don't know when it's gonna come out. And I wrote, wrote about um, a Hindu figure, Apasmara, who is the demon of ignorance. <laughs> So yeah, I've written about other other figures as well. Um, I don't know why. I think it's because um, we get we get so much from these stories. I mean, they govern our you know the way we think about things. So that I thought um, it's interesting to go into them and find you know what might be another hidden truth underneath. You know, I was talking to my partner about Medusa. We're, so we're watching the show Chaos, where it's bringing all these figures are in there, and they're doing these interpretations on them. And so they had the so Medusa is in there, and I and there's a, a white actress is playing Medusa. She's great. I love her. But I said it's kind of um, it's funny that they missed them because the cast is very um, inclusive, culturally inclusive, um, sexual sexuality wise. A lot of trans actors and actresses in this show. Um, and um, and with an ability um, ability um, inclusive as well. So I said, I, I, they really missed an opportunity. They should have had a black actress play Medusa. And I said, why? He said, why would they have a black actress play Medusa? And I said, well, Medusa is North African. Mythologically, she's North African. And many revision, like the, the, the not revisionist, but many of the classicists who look at her as a figure say, okay, she's a woman who has snakes for hair. Like, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Like, if you look at the old photo, uh, carvings of the Egyptians, where the hair is like almost painted and carved like it's dreadlocks, the ancient Egyptians. And so Medusa, in the feminist uh, revision of her, uh, it, she was a North African goddess of wisdom. And then she came into the Greek canon as being conquered by the Greek goddess of wisdom, like Athena puts her face on her shield, basically. So the white, the, the northern Mediterranean conquered the Egyptians, and then they took their figures and like incorporated them into their mythology as a way of expressing the conquest. So Medusa herself is, is like coded as a black goddess of wisdom, basically, as a priestess. So. But the actress who plays her on the show is really good. <laughs> so we missed the opportunity, but we might just have to do another uh, version of Medusa. Medea is another figure from Greek mythology who is a Middle Eastern. I mean, she's Middle Eastern in the myth, too. She's from Colchis, which is on the other side of the um, uh, on the other side of the, the Black Sea. So she's she's a Turkish or Asia Minor, as they called it, um, figure, and then she comes into Greece, and then all of what happens, um, happens with her. So it's very interesting when you look at these dominant myths and see what's just underneath them, you know? Any, anytime a snake appears anywhere, it's like a, a traditional movement from the matriarchal to the patriarchal, 
you watch that happen. Like Apollo comes and kills the, the python, who is the snake of wisdom, who had priestesses, right? And then Apollo comes and kills the snake, and then he uh, uh, gives Cassandra the gift of prophecy, but then he rapes her right after he does that. So it's like really kind of like complicated, like the, the, the change in gender roles in the ancient world is like baked into the myths. You can read it happen. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons I think it's important to go to the stories and like see them again. So for me, Icarus as a gay son is like a total no brainer. Yeah. Thank you. There's one in the back too. Question in the back as well. Um, did you always know that you were going to be a writer and a novel? Was there like a specific role that you realized that it was what you were supposed to do? Um, be a writer in quotes, I don't even know if I knew what that meant. <laughs> you know, I know I loved language, always, and I loved to write, I loved the physical act of writing, always, and then I loved, like, the idea of making poems, always. Um, but I don't think I had any real idea about what it meant or what it was worth, or what I was willing to do for it, um, and that took a long time. I think I was probably 16 before I first took my actual first creative writing class and I knew I really loved doing it. And then I did a whole bunch of other things between for the next 10 years, I mean, including graduating from school, but then I worked as a political organizer for four years and then two more years um, I was working in the corporate world. Um, but it was at the end of that when I thought that literature and writing was my, had always been my love all along and that I would want to try to be more serious about it. And I went to graduate school and I buckled down and I realized that uh, how hard I had to work and then I became, uh, I guess that's when I became whatever I became. But it's always, it's all a process of becoming and even for you, it's even for me, I should say, well you are me in a way, um, uh, it's always the next thing. It's always what happens after. So in my, in my great book, there is new and selected poems. It's poems collected from over the course of 20 years. And I was having a lot of anxiety about like what I was gonna do next. And I was at this festival, for the release of the book, I was at a literary festival in Chicago called the Printer's Row Festival. And Adonis, a great Syrian poet, was at the festival. He's 96 years old. And some and a, a person in the audience asked him, when you look back at your lifetime at work, you know, what do you think is your greatest accomplishment? And he didn't even miss a beat. He said, I do not exist in what I have written. I exist in what I have yet to write. And so I took, I actually wrote in the front of the book, like where you, if you gave me your book where I would sign it to you, I wrote that down in the front of that book, and that's what I read from. So every time I stand up anywhere to read to a group of people, I open to that page and read that page first, just to remind myself that the most important thing is whatever is next. pieces they know they're going to play, they practice them, they practice them, they practice them. Even if they're not performing, they'll practice to keep everything, you know, correct. And dancers the same, you know, there's just so many hours of painstaking, detailed work that goes into even performing a three-minute dance 
you know, the, if you counted up the hours. So for poets, it's the same, you know, you just kind of have to keep practicing, and then you start to kind of hear it a little bit, and you kind of will know, you know, will know where it needs to go. Um, yes, I think that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.